everyone. So uh, I wanted to wrap up this lecture by talking about the limits to evolvability, the limits of adaptation in bacteria, and then kind of transitioning into a really super duper cool recent application of artificial selection called phage therapy. So antibiotic resistance in bacteria, I'm sure you've heard about this by now. Uh, it's really rapidly evolvable because of bacteria's capacity for horizontal gene transfer. And what's really scary about antibiotic resistance is that the resistance, the genes that confer resistance in bacteria can be transferred uh, potentially on the same plasmid. So in one horizontal gene transfer event from cell to cell, a, a bacteria can acquire immunity or resistance to a bunch of different uh, antibiotics. So this sort of, this, this aspect of the genomic architecture of bacteria and the underlying mechanisms of antibiotic resistance makes the resistance to antibiotics really rapidly evolvable in bacteria. So if we're thinking about sort of like Xylikers triangles, um, there's actually uh, a lot of kind of phylogenetic limitations that could potentially be in place here are lifted because of the capacity for horizontal gene transfer. So there's really very little in the way of historical limitations to different bacteria's ability to evolve resistance to antibiotics. A lot of antibiotics that we use are derived from fungi, and this, this is kind of part of an evolutionary arms race that has been going on for the entire evolutionary history of the fungi. So it makes sense, which is a really long time. I mean, you know, it's about a billion years probably. So it makes sense that there's a lot of genes for resistance to various antibiotics that are derived from different fungi. Um, it's cool that there have been so many different antibiotics that have come from fungal cultures. But uh, ultimately, somewhere in the world, there is probably a bacterium that's resistant or that's evolved resistance over the past, you know, billion years to most of the antibiotics that have been evolved by fungi. Uh, a sort of related phenomenon to antibiosis in fungi and this kind of war for resources between bacteria and fungi is fermentation. And so fermentation is, is pretty cool if you like alcohol. Uh, and that may have actually evolved as a way of limiting bacterial growth in places where fungi wanted to exploit resources. So especially things like fruits. And fermentation seems to have evolved around the same time that uh, fruiting plants became kind of common. So this is, this is something, you know, it seems very simple, but it actually seems like something that is hard for bacteria to evolve resistance to. So other antibiotic resistance genes have, have evolved, but anti-ethanol genes, I think, maybe haven't evolved, but, but I actually just Googled it before I made this presentation. And it looks like there are some cases where it, it seems as if um, at least isopropanol, which is rubbing alcohol, uh, has, uh, th there are strains of bacteria that seem to be resistant to rubbing alcohol. So the stuff that's in hand sanitizers um, for a while, people were using some types of, you know, ultimately fungally derived antibiotics. But because those are so easy for bacteria to evolve resistance to, and that can become so problematic in a hospital context, people switched over to mostly ethanol-based uh, antibiotics, which are actually, you know, they're simple, but they're a lot more broad spectrum in a lot of ways. And it seems like it's harder for bacteria to evolve resistance to it. But it, it seems as if even alcohol uh, has, has potentially been, to some extent, cracked by some bacteria. So bacteria seem to be really, really evolvable. And what do you sort of fight something that's really good at evolving resistance? One, one thing that we've that, that people are exploring as a way to sort of combat bacterial infections um, that are driven by bacteria that are really good at evolving, that are really quick evolvers, uh, 
uh, is phages, which are uh, special types of viruses that infect bacteria. So it's technically they're bacteriophages. And so there's this idea out there of phage therapy that basically uh, it's, it's been around for a while. It's actually been around since before the discovery of penicillin, but, um, but it's, it's a little bit hard to control because it's hard to direct and isolate uh, the viruses that infect bacteria. But in, increasingly, people are starting to do some research into how phages might be sort of harnessed to combat infections that seem to be recalcitrant to treatment with other methods. So the, the general potential protocol is, is to try and figure out what bacteria is causing the infection. Uh, you might sequence the bacteria, but you don't actually necessarily have to. You could just try to culture it. And then in some cases, instead of doing this sort of phage prediction selection step, which is really computationally intensive and would require, you know, potentially de novo genetic engineering, you can actually just go out into the environment if you have a little bit more time and see if you can just find phages that infect the type of bacteria that you're interested in. So this idea of, um, of phage hunting is actually uh, a thing that people are pursuing and it's it's not that hard to do it at some level so you could as long as you have some cultures of bacteria that are kind of maybe closely related to uh, bacteria that are the underpinnings of infectious diseases you can test different environmental samples where you've kind of filtered whatever the soil or, or the water that you're testing for things that are about the size of a bacteriophage. And then you test your uh, bacterial culture for, um, for whether or not there's something in the environmental sample that you're getting that kills the bacteria that you're interested in. So there's a bunch of, um, yeah, there's a bunch of examples of people trying to just, you know, teach students about microbial ecology and microbiology by letting them get environmental samples of phages from like the soil near where they go to school. And then um, testing those environmental samples for phage activity against cultures of bacteria that they have going in the lab. So there's just a few different examples of um, these sort of phage hunters around. I guess recently people, uh, <laughs> I think this is at the University of Pittsburgh maybe, or yeah, maybe. I don't think it's a, yeah, some, somewhere in Pennsylvania, people um, isolated a phage that has activity against a bacterium that's related to the one that causes tuberculosis. Uh, and they decided to call it baby Yoda, because if you find a phage uh, in 2020, in early 2020, you gotta call it baby Yoda. So I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah. Kind of cool because it's these particles that are really specific to the one bacterium that is causing the infection. So instead of an antibiotic, which might wipe out all of the bacteria in your body, or you know, almost all the bacteria in your body, including the ones that are useful for digestion, uh, phages are really more specifically targeted towards bacteria. And if we're kind of crafty about things, we can select for phages that are not only targeted at the bacteria that we're interested in, but that are actually targeted at a specific aspect that's problematic about the bacteria that we're interested in. So um, in this case, this, uh, this diagram is showing kind of a general overview of what it's like if you select for phages that adhere to uh, some of the extracellular matrix that some bacterial that some bacteria secrete that makes them problematic. So there are some bacteria that make biofilms in um, either like medical implants or in different parts of your body that are super duper protected against antibiotics and that kind of form their own little environment. Biofilms are actually it's a really cool area of kind of microbial ecology, but it's problematic in a medical context because they're really hard to get rid of.
but if you if you select for phages that adhere to sort of the architecture of the biofilm by getting them to bind to sort of glycan residues and mucus protein backbones, then you can get bacteria that actually are specifically targeting, or sorry, you can get phages that are specifically targeting the actual like problematic aspect of the bacteria. So phage therapy is just a really cool, relatively new, although, you know, people have been kind of doing it since the early 1900s actually, but uh, we've just kind of, we're still in the process of figuring out how to really harness it to effectively combat um, bacterial infections that are uh, resistant to multiple antibiotic strains. Um, but I, I just wanted to talk about it for class in the context of artificial selection, which is selection by humans of a deliberately chosen trait or combination of traits. And the sort of unusual thing about phage therapy in the context of artificial selection is that usually when we think about artificial selection, we think about examples like corn or dogs or the pigeon photo on the cover of your textbook. But um, in the case of phage therapy, we're doing this on organisms that are arguably not organisms. So phages are kind of at this weird boundary of living, not living, but they definitely exhibit the properties of evolution. Um, and so this, this is a case where we're applying artificial selection to entities that are arguably not even alive and that we can't see, but is potentially kind of the underpinnings for a really important medical breakthrough. So there's, there's different ways to sort of specifically select for phages that adhere to uh, proteins or uh, the extracellular matrix of bacteria that are causing infections. But in, in general, what, what people want to do is not only select phages that are um, targeting bacteria that are causing the infection, but we want to select phages that target the aspect of the bacteria that is problematic. So you could select for phages that are targeting a particular protein in the cell membrane of the bacteria that's involved in some, uh, some mechanism of virulence of bacteria, or you could design or select for phages that target the, the parts of the bacterial cell membrane that mediate antibiotic resistance. So you could select or engineer phages that actually target the the specifically problematic aspects of the bacteria, so virulence or antibiotic resistance in these cases. And, you know, it's still kind of early days, but there's, you know, there's 182 of you in this class. There's a really decent chance that at some point in the next five to 10 years, one of you is going to have phage therapy. It's probably never going to replace antibiotics completely just because um, if you can take pills for like 10 days, and cure an infection that's always going to be easier than like de novo searching for phages that target the bacteria and like engineering them. This is this is going to be a really expensive solution that would require, you know, a couple of people working on you like full time. Um, but it is potentially a really exciting way of combating infections that are, you know, recalcitrant to everything else. So I just want to wrap up <laughs> by uh, showing this slide. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this slide before. But uh, talking about different modes of selection, the, the way that we differentiate between things like artificial selection, natural selection, and sexual selection is really sp specifically in what way are survival and reproduction non-random with respect to traits and what's, what's kind of mediating that non-randomness. So if you want to think about kind of the different main sort of families of selection, Sexual selection, which we'll talk about um, probably, you know, definitely after the first exam, is you could kind of frame it as a way that uh, mate competition and mate choice drive uh, fecundity in a way that's non random with respect to heritable traits. Artificial selection is just when we are deciding the specific way in which survival and or reproduction is non-random with respect to heritable traits. And then natural selection is what we usually think about in the context of selection. And that's, that's basically ecology, which is 
obviously a super duper broad category of uh, interactions. You know, it encompasses both biotic and abiotic actors in, in the in the sort of milieu that the organism is in. But natural selection uh, is, and is actually part of the reason that the term ecology was coined. Ernst Haeckel was like, hey, we should like think about what's really driving natural selection. Like, why is it different in some places? Like, what's what's going on? Um, but yeah, natural selection is just generally the way that um, ecology determines the specific way in which survival and or reproduction is non-random with respect to heritable traits. So I think that's it for Friday, February 7th. And I'll see you all in class on Monday for the exam. Yay.